are here to study Psalm 110 today. Uh, today we are here to look at the king and to discover uh, not only what type of person he is, but what his purpose for us is as his followers. Jesus is the king, and this psalm, interestingly today, is um, Jesus' favorite psalm, or at least the one that he quotes the most. It is one of the most quoted psalms in the New Testament. For those of you who aren't familiar, the Bible is made up of two primary chunks, Old Testament and New Testament. Old Testament is before Jesus. Everything is pointing to a Messiah. New Testament is when Jesus came and following. This psalm is one of those psalms written before Jesus. The Jewish people were studying this far before he was born, and it is pointing to the coming of the Messiah, to the coming of the Lord. This psalm is David speaking. So we are going to uh, read, and then we're going to pray, and then we're going to talk. Sound like a plan? Okay. Um, Today, if you have any questions, uh, you can feel free to text the number that will be popping up behind me. Uh, We didn't have any questions last service, but but we we are also talking about the catechism during the offering. So uh, keep that in mind. We're going to read and then pray. Psalm 110, I'm going to read the whole thing through. This is a psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that this morning this would not be just a mental exercise that it wouldn't just be our mind that is stirred, but that you would come after and chase down and change and transform the way we think and the way we feel and the way we love and the way we forgive and the way we serve. God, I pray that this wouldn't just be another sermon to inspire us for a moment and to be forgotten, but that we would be compelled to follow you because of all you have done for us. That we would be freed and courageous in our pursuit of living for you because of the way that you have conquered every enemy we will face. Lord, be our king this morning. Give us eyes to behold and ears to hear. In Jesus' name, all God's kids said. So we have Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is David, and it starts out weird. There are a lot of weird things about this psalm. The first is that it says, the Lord says to my Lord. So David is saying, there is one Lord, and he's saying to my other Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Now, for those of you who have paper Bibles, and it's in some of the translation on your phone Bibles, you'll notice that the Lord is all caps on one of them, but it's not capitalized in the other one. Because on all caps, Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, is translating the word Yahweh, which is the uh, Hebrew word for God, the name for God. And then the lowercase Lord, capital L, lowercase R-D, is usually translating the Greek equivalent of Adonai, which is the Lord, like a king, uh, someone who's ruling over. So David, right out of the gate, is hitting the Trinity. Easily the most easy doctrine in Christianity to describe to people, right? So if you say, Describe the Trinity to me. Well, it's Father, Son, Spirit, separate persons, same being, equal in dignity, value, and worth. They're one and three, but not just three and not just one. Now, if that didn't confuse you, you just weren't listening or you haven't had enough Red Bull or coffee this morning. Because the Trinity is a difficult doctrine to understand. And here, right out of the gates, David said, the Lord, Yahweh, says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Now, this in their culture was going to the right hand was a sign that you were put in the place of authority equal to the person you were with. You are ruling alongside them. You are making decisions with them or on their behalf. So the right hand is, is the good place to sit, which is why when I have um, any family meals, I prefer to have my wife at my right hand. Or really, I'm at her right hand because the, the man is the head, but what is that Greek movie? The woman is the neck, right? Yes, she turns the head wherever she wills. But my wife and I are a team. And, and in this case, sense Jesus is with the right hand of the Father. The Bible says that the Father is invisible in spirit, and Jesus is the external, visible aspect of 
the Godhead, the deity. And David is saying, this is what God, the Father, says to the Lord, my Lord, pointing forward to the Messiah. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. I don't know about you, but um, in my less sanctified years, um, I always thought about conquering. I always thought about making my enemies a footstool. Um, there were seasons of my life uh, pre-Jesus. I'm um, not that it's, I mean, post-Jesus you can get into fights, but I don't think I've had any fights post-Jesus. Have I? Maybe one. Okay. Um, Pre-Jesus, I got in fights. And I don't know if you remember getting in fights or if you had like a boyfriend or a girlfriend or ever got in fights. Whenever you get in a fight in high school, it's this weird thing. Everyone likes to pretend like they won the fight, even if they didn't win the fight. Now, there's a few cases in the Bible where I think it's clear. Like my favorite story that's totally unrelated to today's sermon, there's this story in the book of Acts, uh, the seven sons of Sceva. These guys are casting out demons, and uh, this one demon-possessed guy beats them all up until they're naked. And so rule number one, if you ever leave a fight and your pants aren't on you, you lost that fight. That's rule number one. Um, so I know that. That's a, and then this one, if you are ever in a fight and the, f- the foot of someone is on your throat or head, you've lost that fight. You've, it's, there's no, you're not going to be like down there with the boot in your face saying, I might have won. I think I got a good lick in. Now, this is important for us because too many followers of Jesus are living like Jesus has not won the major battle. The battle against sin and death, it is done. Satan is defeated. He is a dying dragon thrashing his tail in ultimate defeat. He's headed toward the grave. He cannot strike a blow against Jesus that will make him victorious. All enemies of God will become the footstool as Jesus sits on the throne. Now you might be saying, this is, this is the Old Testament God. Interestingly enough, the Old Testament God is, guess what? The same as the New Testament God. We may not like the picture that it paints, but the reality is, and we're going to get to how this works out at the end of this psalm, Jesus sits on a throne above all. His enemies have been conquered. They have lost. They are subdued. And this is the king we serve. Many of us have a picture of God as a a faraway father, maybe, an old father figure. When I was growing up, um, I didn't have a lot of religious upbringing. So in my concept of God, there was an old man with boxing gloves and the red dude in spandex and horns with boxing gloves. And they would be fighting. And whoever, if one was good, then I was good that day. If I was bad, that means the devil knocked out the old bearded man. That was my concept of God, probably from like Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd. But in, in the reality of the spiritual realm, Jesus is enthroned. Jesus is in charge. There is no one that is above him. There is no one that is bigger than him. It is through him all things were created, and by him all things hold together, Hebrews 1 tells us. Jesus is the exact imprint of God's nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. This is the king we serve. And from time to time, we need to see the different roles that God fills. He is a father, a loving dad. He is a savior who sent the son to die for you and for me. And Jesus is now, as we sit here, a king, the king over all kings. He has conquered and will eventually one day finish his conquest against all who are counted as his enemies. Verse 2 of Psalm 110 goes on to just describe this. The Lord sends forth from Zion, from the city of God, from the mountain of God, the mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Man, I've always had this fascination with enemies. Um, In our culture, it's easy to get enemies. Just go post something on any social media platform that's slightly controversial, and you'll find yourself an enemy. The interesting thing about Jesus is that he rules in the midst of his enemies. I like that. I like that he doesn't run from his enemies, that he rules from right there in the midst of them. He goes among the people walking without fear. He stands tall because he knows he is the victorious king. If any of you have had enemies, some of you may have a work enemy. Some of you may have family enemies. Some of you have frenemies. We all know what those are, right? Uh, in, in, the, in life, as enemies surround us, we can do a couple of things. One is you can try to be victorious over your enemies. As an adult, I don't recommend you do this with violence. It's just my personal pastoral recommendation. Um, as a child, I've seen this happening uh, with my kids. My kids 
are at that phase of life where they are unsure how to interact with one another when they don't get their way. In particular, Silas. Um, for those of you who don't know, I've got Jackson. He's, the, um, he's, he's brainy, sensitive, and tech-oriented. Silas is brainy, brawny, and addicted to violence. Savannah, violence, okay? Um, that's just the rank of my kids. Boom, boom, boom. And then we got this new one, Bella Rose. This is her shirt because it's roses. Bella Rose, beautiful rose. I'm going to give in on that name. We could name our next kid that, babe. I'm praying that she is sweet, smart, and cunning so that she can survive the rest of these three. Now, Silas is at this age where he, he doesn't process um, how to not act and how to act. So right now, Silas's go-to move is when he is mad, he punches. I don't know why this happens. He either punches or cries. But he's a, in that fight or flight, he's first a fighter. So if he doesn't get his way, if someone kills him on Minecraft, he gets mad. I'm talking like steam out of the ears, cartoon mad. If you don't believe me, his brother and neighbor friend are right back there. Silas has assaulted both of them on a weekly basis. And he's little. Silas is, is itty bitty. But he's not afraid. And, and for Silas, it, this concept of victory in his mind is, if I have enemies around me, I will crush them. Now, he doesn't realize that he's got not his dad's genes. He's going to be super short, probably like only 5'10", okay? Just a little guy. Jackson and Savannah, they're going to be like 7'2". They're huge. He doesn't realize that he's, he's the, the small guy of the litter, but he, he just fights the enemies. And you can, you can fight your enemies. You can run from your enemies, which is what Silas does sometimes. Sometimes he gets killed in Minecraft, and he runs into my room weeping. Like the world just ended, and I said, what is wrong? And it's something as silly as somebody broke a block of my house in Minecraft. You can run from your enemies. You can fight your enemies. You can ignore your enemies. But sometimes our enemies, they know how to push our buttons. Sometimes our enemies live under the same roof as us, and they can push. Sometimes our enemies are like Jim Carrey in Ace Ventura when Nature Calls, making that noise that you cannot ignore. So you have a choice. Do you fight? Do you flee? Do you ignore? There's, there's another way that we can do this. See, any enemy of yours, if you are one of God's kids, if you're in God's forever family, if you have placed your hope and trust in Jesus, your enemies are God's enemies if you're standing behind God. If you get behind the victorious king, because nowadays it's different. Nowadays the generals sit in tents and they send troops out. In the ancient history, generals would be at the front of the line marching forward. They would be the ones that would carry the flag and the sword, and people would say, that's my king, and they'd follow after him. Jesus is the victorious king, and when you get behind somebody who is big, you usually can be infused with their courage. You, you can see that they are large, and they will provide some air of safety if you get in their wake. And this is where your enemy should stand if you line up with God. Now, if you go off on your own and you ride your own wave, I'm not promising you anything, but if you could get behind Jesus and say, God, I'm going to follow you, and I'm going to be behind you, then any enemies you encounter along the way are enemies that the victorious king will already have conquered and ruled and put his foot upon their throats. It's, it's just like in sports. It's just like in a, well, we'll go with sports. Since it's football season, and there are three blessed people here, Steelers fan, Steelers fan, Steelers fan, um, and then leadership matters. Who you follow matters in sports. It makes all the difference in the world. You can look at the great teams, and the teams that are always consistently good have great leaders. And whether or not you like them, uh, the, you know, if you like uh, the Dark Lord, Bill Belichick, and Tom Brady, they're good leaders, and they have constant victory. Or maybe you are among those who are called blessed, and you believe Ben Roethlisberger and Mike Tomlin are great leaders. We're going to follow them to the Super Bowl. Can I get an amen? amen? That's right. You know that's right. That's the only reason I'm a pastor here is to get that. Or if you don't have good leaders and you're like the Tampa Bay, no, just kidding. Um, <laughs> you can, see, I know, I'm not trying to lead Tampa people to Jesus, just people, people, okay? Uh, th there's this idea, though, that if you are behind a good leader, you will be safe. I love it. Um, I don't love it. I love, I love how my family responds when they see me doing something that is like uh, at the front lines, 
taking a leadership role, uh, whether it's breaking up a fight. If I see fights in public, I don't like violence anymore. So if I see fights, I just break them up. And God made me large, so it's really easy. I just I pick one person up, or I pick another person up, and it's very easy. Um, this weekend, I didn't break up a fight, but we were down at the museum, uh, down at the Glazer area, and the Curtis Park on the Riverwalk. And we're at this park. It's so crowded. I mean, there's an ice skating rink there right now, and there's people everywhere. And all of a sudden, we hear somebody yell, a lady is having a seizure on the ground. And I'm like looking over, and my wife, she knows that I, I'm addicted to uh, action. There's fight or flight people, people that jump into action with adrenaline, or people that run. I jump into the action. So I'm like, seizure, what's going on? Like I've been prepared for this because uh, Jared, okay, he had, he's had seizures here, and I was there, and I've, had, I've been a pastor a long time. So all of a sudden, this lady's seizing on the ground. There's dozens of people around. And I'm running. I got my camera. I'm taking my DSLR camera off. In my mind, it's like slow motion. And I'm like, do, 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 do. but I'm sure out loud it was like, oh, yeah, I got this. And I get down. I set my camera down. And, uh, and someone says, be careful. She's bleeding. Now, keep in mind, people are already around her. Nobody's touched her. They're just letting her shake on the ground. Her name is D. She's okay, I hope, by the way. Um, and so I just jump in. I'm like, boom. And then someone goes, watch out. She's bleeding on her head. And I'm like, She's on the ground shaking. You're just going to let her head bounce off the concrete. So I put my hand under her head, and I feel just the blood coming under my hand. And I'm thinking, like, okay, we got this. Get her on her side because nurses told me that that's good so she doesn't choke, vomit, boom. Get on her side, hold her head, do this. You call 911, you do this. And then my kids are coming around me. And my kids, Savannah's like, Daddy, what's her name? I'm like, that's a good idea. What's her name? Get in the wallet. What's her name? It's the only time you're allowed to go through a woman's purse is right then, okay? Open the purse. Get her phone. Get her name. And nobody was around her. Her, her boyfriend, who, by the way, super awkward. Her boyfriend didn't, uh, the daughter of this woman didn't know that the boyfriend was her boyfriend until that moment as the mom is seizing. I'm like, who are you? Are you the husband? I'm the boyfriend. The teen daughter goes, what? I'm like, oh. And, 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 we're just, we're just, what's your mom's name? We're just saving. I'm saving this. And my kids are coming around. And, I mean, the whole situation is bonkers. And then, in the midst of, and then after this, we're, you know, I save her because I'm a hero, okay? And, uh, and, and we're leaving, and then we, I get in this long conversation with my kid about fight or flight. He says, Daddy, like, why did you go in? I'm like, well, buddy, uh, when there's an emergency, adrenaline comes out of your glands, and certain people run to to help, and certain people run from to flee, called fight or flight. It doesn't mean you're fighting. It means you're really going to go toward it or away from it. And he goes, well, how do I become a, someone that goes toward it? Like you. I said, I don't know. You just, you just do it. Like God made you big. You protect and love people. That's all I know. And, and there's these thoughts because as this lady was bleeding, people were worried like, well, she's bleeding. Watch out. And someone had said like, oh, you've got her blood all over your hand. Like, aren't you scared of dying? All of my kids can answer that question for you. Ask any of my children, is your daddy scared of dying? And especially if you ask Silas, he would be like, no, he longs for the day. <laughs> I'm ready. So I'm like, little blood, little road trip to Jesus. That's all this is. Maybe a prolonged, agonizing road trip, but it's a road trip. And because I know who I'm following. The, no, the reason that I don't have this fear is because I know who I'm following. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm afraid of certain things. Like this week, we put up a new projector. I was in a lift. With, uh, with Gary. Well, first I was in love with Andy. Andy and I were over the maximum weight limit. Now, I'm a nerd and a reader. So I look at Andy, I look at me, I look at the sign that says not more than 500 pounds. I ask Andy, how much do you weigh? I ask myself, how much am I going to really weigh and not lie to myself today? I add those together. I said, Andy, we shouldn't do this. But we did over and over again. And Andy thought it was hilarious to shake the lift. <laughs> right? I'm like, sure, you think it's funny. I'm up here literally denting steel with my bare hands because I'm terrified. Because this isn't death. This is just maimed right here. Death, I'm okay. Maimed, not okay. I should be okay because I know who I'm following. The reason why I, I will break up fights and the reason why I believe um, God has wired me this way isn't anything to do with just myself. It's not about me um, helping people. It's not about me uh, breaking up violence. It's the fact that ever since I became a follower of Jesus, I've been fascinated with following the king and doing what he says because no matter what happens in this life he is in charge and when my days are done they are done i cannot add one day or take away one day from my life it doesn't matter how much uh dirty lettuce aka kale you eat you could eat kale and oatmeal you could be gluten-free egg-free dairy-free you can run 5k every day when your time has come 
your time has come. That's it. It's all over. It's all done. Which is why, instead of focusing and obsessing about all of these little things we manage, we need to focus and obsess about following and serving the king. Because in his wake, every enemy that will come across my path has been defeated. In his wake, the effects of sin and death will not uh, affect me for eternity. They can touch me in this life, and that is all. When I'm 150 years old, all of the diseases, all of the death and loss that I would have experienced will be a memory. Are you following this king? Are you in his wake of his plan, of his purpose? Or are you living your purpose running concurrent? Do you dip into Jesus when it's convenient? Is Jesus for you one of the things you juggle? Or is Jesus for you the center and the hub of everything that you do? Because here's what happens if you're a King Jesus follower. Verse 3, your people, that's you and I, if you believe in Jesus, will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. I love that. God's people are volunteers. God's people will serve. God's people will offer themselves freely. Now, this is a, a good segue. Each January on the first week, I like to do a little state of the church. I'm not doing a big one today, but I thought it was interesting because I was reading this verse and meditating in this verse this week, and I was thinking, God, how, are, how do the chapel people respond to you? Do they freely offer themselves to you? Do they offer themselves to you trusting that you are the king, trusting that you have all the power? Do they offer themselves to you as blameless people coming clothed in Jesus? And I, and I, I just have to brag on you guys a little bit. Because the average church, uh, churches in America, well, let me back up. Pastors, we're weird people, okay? When we get together, we, it's like a spitting contest. You, you meet another pastor, and you're like, hey, I'm a pastor at such and such and such and such. Where are you, pastor? I'm a pastor at such and such and such and such. Next question you get, like when you guys meet new people, it's usually, hey, my name is blank. And then the next question that almost everyone asks is, what do you do for a living? Because it's a natural conversation starter. Pastors are like, hey, my name is blank. And the very next question we ask is, how many people go to your church? And all of us lie. Every pastor is a fisher of men, which means we lie about the size of the fish we caught. Um, so we're like, my, in my church, you wouldn't even believe. We're like 300. And if you see them go, ooh, 300, you're like, yeah. But if they're like 300, you're like 300,000 <laughs> people. I don't know why we do that. We're addicted to the, how many people come to warm a chair. And, and, uh, and this week, I had this thought, um, because I was thinking about this. The thing I need to be concerned about is whether you see Jesus clearly enough to go serve him, volunteer for him, love him freely. Not under compulsion, like if you don't live for God, then he's about to smite you. Not out of fear, like I've got to do this for God or I'm going to get flat tires, bad jobs, and bad finances. No, but because God is your king who loves you, who gave himself for you, do you freely say, I'm coming to follow you. I am in this game to win it. That was my question of the chapel, because as we compare with pastors, you know, I'm, I had the best compliment that I've had since I've lived in Florida. Um, well, the guy helped me put up the projector. He's a church consultant who does tech stuff. And, um, and he said, dude, you wouldn't believe what happened. I was, I was out in this church in Lakeland. And I'm like, oh, cool. And he goes, yeah, well, I was talking with the pastor, you know, because he, he goes to other churches, helps them talk about stuff. I don't let him help here just with tech stuff. Don't worry. Um, but, but he said, I was talking to this pastor in Lakeland, and he goes, oh, you live in Fishhawk. And Andy said, yeah. And they said, do you know that tall pastor in Fishhawk? I heard there's a real tall pastor in Fishhawk who talks about his own sin from the pulpit. And Andy goes, oh, yeah, I know that guy. And Andy was telling me this story, and I said, wait, wait, was it a bad thing that I talked about my own sin from the pulpit? And he says, oh, yeah. And I said, I'm counting that as a win. I like that. I like that. And, and here's, here's my new measure that I want to begin measuring, because we measure everything each week. We measure how many dollars we get. We measure how many butts are in the seats, how many kids are in the classes. I want to begin measuring how many jacked up people come to the chapel who can be open about where they are at with God, but say, I'm going to follow God no matter what. I, I'm going to f I failed this week, but I'm going to follow God tomorrow. I failed today, I'm going to follow God the next hour. Uh, I'm less concerned with how many people come here and more concerned with how many people are getting in the wake of the king. The wake is in the boat wake. Jesus is going this way. Are we going to be in his wake or are we going to be doing something on our own? The chapel is a very generous church family where, where every church, uh, a lot of churches in America are on the decline. We are on the incline. 
where a lot of churches are on the decline of giving, we've been on the incline in giving. Um, and not just like the amount of money, like the percentage-wise of people who are generous to support the ministries here. Uh, where the chapel, uh, where, where many churches struggle reaching uh, families with young kids, the chapel has too many kids. I, you, need, you need to stop breeding, okay? This is a, a thing. Whereas um, the, the chapel, it, whereas a lot of churches are uh, homogenous of like one theological camp or pro- predominantly one racial background, uh, we are trying and I'm striving to make this massively messy, diverse, theological, diverse, racially, ethnically, div- I want diversity in every way, poor, rich, black, white, Asian, we need more Filipinos, um, come on people, help lead some Filipinos to Jesus, there's only like four of us in here, can I get an amen, <laughs> amen, you guys don't know, because clearly if you didn't amen, you've never had a lumpia, okay, we need more uh, d- diverse, and I love this because we, we are a diverse church. We have people here who say, can I bring my flags to worship? And I say, no. And then we have people here who are like, we can't raise hands in worship. I'm like, yes. We have some people here who say, I just don't like drums. And I'm like, sorry? And we have some people here who say, can we get an organ? Not probably. But we have an organ now, a little fakey organ. And we're going to have drums. And we're going to have people that want to bring their own tambourine. And I'm okay with that. If, as long as you don't bring a snake, I'm cool with your charismaticness. If you bring a snake, we're having a conversation out behind the dumpster, okay? We have people who are conservative theologically. We have people who are like, I am a Reformed, Prisba, Baptist, Tistian, Methodist. And then we have people who are Pentecostal, God, Athe, Rouge, We do, but, we have, but we have people who need Jesus and who are saying, I'm going to get in the wake of Christ. I'm going to follow him so that my enemies are only his enemies, which he has conquered. I'm not going to go out of the bounds of his purposes. I'm going to serve. And it says we're going to serve in our holy garments. These are not our garments. They're God's holy garments. It's just like with the armor of God. Um, a lot of times I've heard sermons about the armor of God in Ephesians. You know, put on the breastplate of righteousness. That means be righteous. Put on the, the belt of truth. Put on the helmet of salvation. You have to just go all the way to the beginning. This is the the armor of God, not the armor of your abilities. It is the armor of God providing for you what you could not provide for yourself. Holy garments are provided to you by Jesus through faith. But we're going to keep going. Now I'm going to skip over probably the most weird, mysterious part of this whole psalm. Verse 4 it says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. We know this. God does not change his mind. He is a priest forever. Jesus is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a mystery character. If you want to read the story, it's in Genesis 14, 15, 16. Uh, Basically, where Abraham went, destroyed a bunch of places, and then this random guy just shows up. He doesn't come from anywhere. It just says, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, the king of Shalom, the king of peace. He comes in, and then Abraham sees him. Abraham gives him 10% of everything he has. Melchizedek blesses Abraham, and then Melchizedek leaves. And that's it. But this weird character who comes in and vanishes. It's spoken about in the Bible. It's a very mysterious character. I can't wait to find the actual answer because commentators disagree. Many commentators believe that that Melchizedek was a pre-incarnate version of Jesus. So before Jesus was born into the baby flesh, he showed up throughout the Old Testament a few times. Theophanies, appearances of God down on earth. People believe that it was that. We do know that one thing is for sure. Melchizedek was at least a type of Christ, if not Jesus pre-incarnate coming down to earth. He was someone who has no beginning and no end, the Bible says, of Melchizedek. Someone who has no mother and father. And someone who was superior to Abraham and then gave Abraham God's blessing, the father's blessing. In verse 5, the voice shifts. If you have an English Bible, you'll see the end of quotation marks. So the beginning, David is recounting what the Lord said to my Lord. And then it switches. It says, the Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. I, I think God's wrath is one of the most under-talked about concepts and doctrines in Christianity because we love the love part. But without the wrath, the love is less loving. Now, let me explain. Um, if, if somebody does something terrible to you and, um, and you are very angry with them, in order to overcome that anger and forgive them, you have to have a greater level of forgiveness and love. The greater the wrath is, the greater the love must be that overcomes it. God's wrath against sin is infinite, which means that if he would send his son Jesus to die for you and for me to absorb that wrath, then his love must be more than that wrath because it overcomes, it pays for in full 
the wrath of God. There will be a wrath that t- does come. Jesus will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. Jesus is not just the rosy-cheeked, blue-sashed, white-robe-wearing guy that plays with sheep and children. Uh, the Revelation gives us a very amazing picture of Jesus coming on a white horse. And it's a metaphorical, apocalyptic literature, but it says a sword is coming out of his mouth and fire from his eyes, and he's got a tattoo on his thigh. That's where I have my justification for tattoos. When conservative people say, you have tattoos and you're a pastor, I'm like, Jesus has tattoos and he's a savior. Um, he's coming in, in a way that we don't expect to judge the world. Some of us think of this as just the hammer. I need you to understand something. He's judging, he's, he's weighing out the world based on what we follow, based on who we're aligned with. Are we with the king or are we creating or trying to be our own king or queen? And this is what sin is. It's this idea of, of sin being what you do and don't do. It's, that is true, but it's incomplete. Um, everyone is a sinner. If you come to the chapel, I remind us always that we are a broken group of sinners who are saved and loved by a great and glorious and perfect Savior. Sin is not just that you lie sometimes or you've killed somebody or that you steal often. Um, Sin, at the core of it all, is when you say, I'm not going to serve God as God. I'm going to serve something else as God. I'm not going to make God who deserves to be put on the level of ultimate in my life. He's not going to be my ultimate pursuit. This is going to be my ultimate pursuit. It could be sexual pleasure. It could be money. It could be fame. It could be power. Any good, even good things. And usually it's not a bad thing that's sin at the root of it. It's a good thing that we turn into an ultimate thing. We call these in the Bible idols. When you say, the thing I'm living for is not God, but this. Now, in that moment, you have sinned. In that moment, you have chosen which team, which king you are following. When it talks about judgment in the Bible, it's not... God coming down just to say, I'm going to smite you for that one time you did this one thing. It's God saying, I'm going to sort out those who chose to follow me as king from those who chose to follow something else as king. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. So if you work for sin, if you work for non-God, if you work for for money, fame, power, etc., pleasure, whatever it is that you put as ultimate in your life, whatever gives you a sense of significance, whatever gives you a sense of identity, if it's not God, That's something else, it's other, that's sin. The Bible says if you work for that, your paycheck, the wages of sin, is death. So so you're choosing your employer. And the amazing thing is, is that we don't even get to work for God because the very next part of Romans 6.23 is the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. So we, we have to labor for sin, work for sin. And those of you who have been trapped in sin know that it's a cruel, cruel master, whether it's an addiction to something or whether it's a constant anxiety over not having enough. Whatever it is, we, we all have experienced the fact that when we go off track and we put our hope in something other than God, the crushing weight and fear of anxiety and depression and difficulties and stress can bear a human soul down to almost nothing. That's the effect of sin driving us toward death. But with God, it's the free gift. It doesn't say... But the work for the Lord is eternal life. But if you're really, really good for a really long time, you get eternal life. It says, no, but the free gift. The only thing we have to do to receive our holy clothing that covers us is to put our hands out and say, can I please have it? I need it so desperately. This is how we come into this place where when judgment comes, God's not coming down just to say, duck, duck, you're damned. Duck, duck, you're damned. He's coming down and saying, my children, you have followed me. I'm your king. And then he's coming down saying, I I gave you the options. I I sent the people. I sent the stars. I put nature and I tuned the universe to proclaim who I am. But you walked and turned away. The judgment is less of the gavel falling and more of the scales being placed. Whose crown are you serving and living for? Is it your own or is it the king, Jesus? Now this brings us to something that I want to talk about today because we are an amazing church family. I am super, super blessed uh, to pastor such an incredible group of people and to lead on alongside the elders and the team here. Um, one of the things that, that I love about this church family is that you guys, um, most of you, are 
are doers. And not all of you. I mean, we're maybe 50-50, or maybe we should do Pareto's Law, 80-20, I don't know. But, but I have to admit, I, I love the kids in my neighborhood. It, it's the best. So I, I've got a group of kids that come around, different backgrounds, different uh, family dynamics, different beliefs. But one of the things I love is that when something happens with the kids and they talk to me, the kids actually listen. Um, it's very different from being a pastor to adults where adults don't listen, usually. We nod, we laugh, we giggle, and we go out and we stay relatively the same. But kids, I mean, these kids listen. Uh, just, just yesterday, this is one of my favorite proud moments as a dad. Um, and by proud, I mean, man, this was pretty bad. Um, one of my kids was at the park, and my kids like to jump. I don't, I don't understand. They like to jump because they just like to tempt the fate of ER gods, okay? Uh, so they jump from ladders to slides, slides to ladders. So apparently, uh, my kid was there, and he was jumping, and there was an adult there. And now, I've had a lot of conversations with my son, who's here, about, you know, being respectful, you know, don't, talk, don't be mean to others, be kind, etc. Unfortunately, my kid has the same disease that I was born with. It's called sarcastic ease, okay? Um, so, so as he's jumping, a mom who's an older person, and I've, I've done a terrible job at raising my kids, and, uh, you know, I grew up in a generation where you didn't spank your kids, you told them to go in the corner and think about it. Um, I really appreciate being in the pseudo-south where I meet some of you, and you guys really have this uh, fear of the Lord put in your children. Um, so, so my kids, though, he's over here, he's jumping, and a mother says, hey, don't jump onto that slide, because if you do, what if, what if my kid was down there and you smushed my kid? And I wasn't there, so I don't know how it went, but I could hear my son's voice saying this, something like, well, if your son was there, obviously I wouldn't jump. He said this to an adult female, to which she called him a name. And the kids come running over to my car. I'm pulling in, they see me, and they want to tell me what just happened. So they they come over and say, Ryan, Mr. Ryan, daddy, daddy, daddy. We were at the park. Jackson did this. A lady said this. And then when the lady... When Jackson talked back to the lady, she called him a smart B-U-T-T, but not B-U-T-T, if you know what I mean. And I was like, so in my heart, I thought, oh, I think what's going to come out of Jackson's mouth next means I'm a bad parent. Jackson, what did you say back? And, and this conversation went on. Now, I'm glad that he's not totally like me. He's got some of the kindness of his mother, because the first time someone called me one of those, I said, at least I'm not a dumb one. And um, I, was, I needed Jesus. I need Jesus. My mom will tell you I still need Jesus. Uh, but, but in this moment, I thought two things. One is I need to teach my kid more about respecting adults, no matter who they are and where they are. And, and it's amazing because as we talk, I tell them, respect adults. Don't talk back to adults. And the most amazing thing happens. I don't know how it works, but kids change, and they listen. I know this is a fleeting moment for me. I know that soon I'll have only teenagers, and then they will not listen to me for the rest of their lives until they repent when they're 22. But, from, but for right now, my kids listen, and it's amazing because all the neighborhood kids, they, they'll come over and I'll say, don't do this. And then they're like, okay, we won't. I'm like, oh, really? Because as a pastor, I'm like, hey, guys, don't do this. And most of you guys are like, what? I'm doing that. This week I was going to put a little button in your bulletin that said, do not touch the red dot. And I was going to put it in your bulletin, but I didn't want to do that because everyone that saw it would have pushed it. It would have been a 100% fail rate. Because for whatever reason, my kids and the neighborhood kids listen to me, but y'all are rebellious sinners that need Jesus. But here's what I'm asking today. If you want to be in the wake of the king, I've created a new mission I got exhausted with all the churchies. Win, build, send, even the ones we have. Gather, grow, give, go. Like, they're all great. I get it. But it's so churchy. Like, you're never going into a business, like whatever business it is, storage unit, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, whatever. You're not going into one of those, and they're like, our mission is to win, build, send, blah, 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 blah. That's only churches. Only churches do weird, goofy, mnemonic devices. So I created a, a mission for the chapel. This is it. This is all our mission. I'm going to give you the long version for those of you who are smart and have memories like elephants, and then I'm going to give you the short version for those of you who barely passed the third grade, okay? Long version. Are you guys ready? You got your eyes and ears on, boys and girls? Look, look, listen, listen. Here we go. This is the long sentence. Repeat after me. Fill every street with the love of Jesus. That's the long version. 
You guys are geniuses because you're going to memorize the short version. Are you ready? The short version, because I just want it to stick in your brain like a virus that doesn't kill you. Fill every street. That's it. I don't have the rah-rah speech. I'm not going to drum up the, the coach enthusiasm. I'm going to say, if you want to follow Jesus with the chapel, this year, the phase of life that we are in is this. I don't, I'm not concerned with how many butts are in seats. I'm not concerned with how many nickels get into the offering plate. I am utterly and completely consumed and concerned with the fact that we as followers of Jesus sometimes treat him and following him as a side dish when it is the main course of action. So our only mission this year, where I'm not trying to win, build, send, you can lead people to Jesus, I'm super cool with that. You can disciple people, we should always be doing that. My main mission for all of us is to fill every street we live on and work on with the love of Jesus. Now, because I'm a pastor and I can't be totally not nerdy, I did come up with a slightly mnemonic device. You say, how do I fill every street? There's three ways. First, presence. Be present on your street. Don't hide in your lanai's even when it's 42 degrees outside. Walk out of the front of your house and say hello to a neighbor. Some of you are naturally good at this. My father-in-law knows more neighbors in his neighborhood than I do in mine, and they've been living there for two months. I've been living in my neighborhood for two and a half years because he's a, a people person. I'm not a people person. All of my people peopling happens right now. After this, I go home and I read books like an introvert. So first, be present. Second, pray. Walk and pray for everyone you know. I love doing this in my neighborhood because we're just one loop where I live. So I walk and I pray for every family that I know. Boom, pray for you, pray for you, pray for you. I pray for marriages, I pray for kids. I especially pray for some kids. And then the last one, pres pre be present, pray, party. That's it. This year, 2018, fill every street with the love of Jesus by being present, by praying, and by partying. If you don't believe in partying, um, read the Bible. The Bible is all about parties. If you're like, I don't even know how to throw a party, the Bible is full of examples on what type of parties to throw. You may not have realized that, but the Bible has bread parties. We call it Passover. Throw a bread party. I know that not all of you are gluten-free. Bake cookies and say, hey, I'm going to bake cookies and just bring them to my neighbors. It might be awkward because maybe you've been neighbors with someone for 20 years and you've never even said hello. That'll be the most awkward thing. They're, thinking, they're going to think you're trying to off them to buy their property, but do it. If you don't like bread parties, the Bible has wine parties. Jesus threw the biggest wine rager of all time. He went to a party and brought the best wine, all the wines. I'm trying to think of this way to do it in my neighborhood where I just have a wine walk. And it's easy. It's a twofer if you do a wine party because then, A, you're partying like Jesus, and then, B, you can see who struggles with alcoholism so you could lead them to Jesus. It's a win-win, Okay? If you don't like wine or if you struggle with alcoholism, I don't recommend it. If you struggle with alcohol addiction, don't do the wine party. That'd be dumb. Do a Martinelli's party or a beef jerky party. But, but there are those types of parties. There's parties where they would cook whole bulls. I'm still waiting for the day that I get to put a bull on a spigot. Okay? It's going to be like the day that we baptize. Like maybe we'll set a goal. If we baptize 50 people this year, baptize new believers, then I'm going to get with Edwin and I'm going to go buy a whole cow. Because we're in Florida, you guys, and I've seen signs where you can buy a whole stinking cow. And I'm just going to put a, a stick through the cow and light a fire out there. And I just want to turn it around. And I want to celebrate people getting baptized. And I've never turned a cow around on a stick before. It's, a, it's another twofer. But these are examples of partying for Jesus. If you are not the party person, don't worry. Someone else here is. If you don't even know how to party, don't worry. One of these people near you knows how to party. If you don't have supplies, come ask me. We'll get you a jumpy house. You can set it up in your front yard and kill the grass. If you're like, I don't, I don't feel comfortable partying. What do I do? Do I just invite kids over? No. If you have no kids of your own, don't invite kids over. That's creepy. But you can party age-appropriate parties. This is the mission. And I have this hunch that as we keep going, as we keep pressing into this thing that we do called Jesus and life with him, the other things are going to come naturally. The, the chapel, we, we are growing every month, becoming better and better at being family. You guys have a great heart to serve. The area where I want us to grow this year is in our missionary attitude. Viewing, instead of viewing as mis missionaries as people that go somewhere far, viewing yourself as a missionary right here on your street. So that's it, the mission. Fill every street. Pretty soon, um, as soon as Edwin goes on a work trip, because he's our executive pastor, as soon as he leaves in the work trip, I'm going to spend a bunch of money and, and remodel the lobby. And, um, and when I do that, I'm just going to have this mission out there. 
and, I, and I'm gonna, you're going to see more of me. And if you want to hang out with me, all you've got to do is text and call. I, I'm a big boy. I don't get overwhelmed. Some of you are like, well, you have too many issues. You have th- people always asking for you. Like, look, sometimes it's a choice between uh, hanging out and having coffee with you or seeing a grumpy person at the hospital. For sure, I'm going to hang out with you. But, but until we learn to get out in the streets and do it, like our band of brothers that meet at this coffee shop or at the Panera, or like some of our mom groups that will, that will go to the park strategically, some of our small groups that will, instead of meet one night, maybe go out and pray for their neighbors or just have a party. We don't need to be weird, quirky Christians. We need to be people that fill every street with the love of Jesus. And when we do that, I'm excited to see what happens. Because as we talked about in, my, uh, in our Band of Brothers group yesterday, we talked about people that don't come to church. And we talked about what if someone came to church. And I don't know why we do this as followers of Jesus. We always go to the most extreme. What if a murderer came to church? How would we react? I mean, if they were an active murderer, probably appropriately, just get away from them. Hopefully they're a reformed murderer and not currently murdering people. But I'm confident we have police officers and Floridians here. They'd shoot them first. Um, or a rapist. Or two. We always go to extreme in Christianity. I thought, you know, when we start to fill every street, we're going to run into people who aren't like us, who don't look like us. We're going to run into people who believe differently from us. We're going to run into people who will hate us because we don't believe exactly like them, because our culture has produced this divide. How we love them, how we serve them, how we party with them, how we pray for them will make all the difference not only in your life and not only in their lives, but in the culture and impact the church has because for too long the church has been waning in influence. We're doing the same old things and expecting different results. It's time for us to take a proactive approach to living as a family of missionaries who are out to serve our communities and our king. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your good news. I thank you that you sent Jesus to be my king. God, I pray that you would fix our eyes on Jesus and that you would teach us to follow in the wake of Jesus, that we wouldn't try to be our own God or serve another master besides him. Lord, I pray for those in this room today, this morning, who are still skeptical and pursuing and asking questions. I pray that I pray that you would answer their questions, that you would open doors for conversation. I pray that you would change all of our hearts so that we would be ambassadors of your loving kindness and forgiveness. I pray that you would change our eyes so that we would see the hurting, the lost, the broken, and the scared who are living right across the street. I pray that you would open our ears so that we would be the best listeners in our communities, that we would understand and have empathy for the problems of others and step in to be kind and to bring peace in the midst of chaos that so often surrounds us. Bless us today as we go in Jesus' name.